Good afternoon. Welcome, folks, and welcome if you're joining us via live stream. I shall pray, and then we'll jump in. Father in heaven, thank you for the great food and fellowship we have just enjoyed. Thank you for the family of God here at Parsippany Baptist Church, and the joy it is to serve you uh, together here. I pray that you'd bless our afternoon together. I pray that it wouldn't be uh, mundane or boring, but of, of great interest uh, to, uh, to these folks as we highlight an entire conference in a quick fashion. In Jesus' name, amen. Shepherd's Haven Online is the website address. I say that because there's actually a Shepherd's Haven in Pompton Lakes that's a, an adult daycare center. And I even discovered there is a German Shepherd Haven out there, a rescue place for German shepherds. So uh, I share that at Shepherd's Haven. <clears throat> I think you can view most of the sessions online if you are interested. Those of us who are there, I heard this many times during the conference, it's like you're drinking from a fire hose. So it is really intense for four days, but in a, in a good sense. So to prepare for this, I actually went through, I don't know, I had a whole beginning at 9.15 p.m. And they said, no. And then Dr. McAllister, on a, the next day, he made the comment that I've never been a speaker who was speaker number nine <laughs> at, at the day. So, so Shepherd's Haven has that, uh, that reputation. Here is the purpose statement of Shepherd's Haven, a pastor's conference and online resource ministry created for pastors by pastors. Our mission is to provide genuine fellowship and encouragement as we strive to sharpen exegetical and ministry skills of pastors and church leaders on the battle lines for Jesus Christ. We also seek to provide a haven of rest and support for pastors as they tend and care for God's sheep. So historically, designed for pastors primarily, but you can tell from the inclusion of the word pastors and church leaders, any Anyone who comes and wants to be equipped uh, is welcome to come. Now, this year they did, they did make the statement where we're going to limit it to mail. We did have uh, Judy Cole there who was running the refreshments and dessert table, that sort of thing. But um, ladies, you'll have to find your, uh, your own conference. I was mentioning earlier, I, I was just so touched, touched, I don't know if that's a word, by so many men who were there who weren't pastors. I don't know why anybody would want to come for four days and hang out with pastors, but, but I enjoy their fellowship, and they apparently enjoy the pastors. So I mentioned lobster fisherman, a seafood restaurant owner, someone who works with satellite technology, an underwriter, a collection agent. Oh, there's a weather forecaster from the National Weather Service was there. He's now being trained by Pastor Lawrence Brown for the ministry. So that's uh, neat. And there were a number of team guys. I'll say more on that a little bit later. This is the ministry team. You, I'm sure you recognize the top four guys. Historically started with Dr. Ken Brown, who's now with the Lord, and Kurt Brown. So those two are no longer a part of the picture. So it's the three Brown brothers and then the Brown brother-in-law. That would be Howard Cole. And they have expanded that to those who aren't in the Brown family to include pastors Damaris, Cowan, and Lewis. And I, I think that was a good thing, and the Brown brothers agree that it was a good thing to expand that. Kind of reminded me of when Bob Jones University finally had a president who wasn't named Jones. I think that, that was probably a good thing. Sean Cowan, he's the guy I've mentioned before who was a policeman, uh, formerly in the military, then a policeman, and then Pastor Lawrence Brown, trained him. So, so we can remember when Sean would come to Shepherd's Haven as a policeman. And uh, so now he is a pastor. So he's way, way up there in Harrington, Harrington, Harrington Maine. <clears throat> Most years, we just do it in-house. We pastors just divide up the responsibilities. This year, they did bring in two outside speakers for Monday night and Tuesday. And then these guys had to fly out. So here's Dr. McAllister, Vice President at Bob Jones, uh, had been working at GFA Missions. Um, so he he's just uh, has a real heart for ministry, real, real burden for training people for, uh, for ministry. He was uh, just the nicest guy. And then Dr. Fant, 
who focuses on strengthening the American church through consulting, revitalization, the interim pastor ministry, and church planting. Uh, he made the comment, I'm the bad cop and Dr. McAllister is the good cop. And, and so as, as we got to know them better, we understood what he meant. So Dr. Fan, he just he just speak his mind. In fact, at one point, there was a question and answer time, I think. And did he say something like, man, don't at times you just get so frustrated, frustrated you feel like killing your people or something? <laughs> we all to, what? You're not supposed to say that, even if you think that you don't say that, let alone live stream. But well, that's just Dr. Fan. Whereas Dr. McAllister, you would think a vice president, and he's a well-known name in fundamental circles, but just just the absolute nicest guy I sat down next to him at one of the meals, and he immediately said, well, Jeff, okay, nice meeting you. Tell me, tell me your story, you know, tell me about your life, your ministry. That's uh, just the way it was. So what do we have here? So first thing, uh, well, first thing, of course, is supper Monday night, and then, and then there's going to be a 6 o'clock session, 7 o'clock, oh, wait. No, supper was at five, right? So it was six, seven, eight, and then then I then they put me on at nine fifteen. After all these pastors have had a busy Sunday, and then they've traveled eight hours on Monday, and they've already sat through th three sessions, and then I gotta gotta speak to them. But so this is Pastor Mark Brown. He's just kind of introducing the week. We recognize new folks who were there, and he just kind of gave a quick overview of Titus. The character of the elder. Elder, of course, is just one of the many names for a pastor. The need to teach sound doctrine and the expected results of good works. Have you seen those three ortho words? Orthopathy, orthodoxy, and orthopraxy. So that was kind of a neat way of summarizing those. Sound doctrine. Throughout the book of Titus, the English word sound is based on the Greek word we get our English word hygiene. So it means sound or healthy. Anything else I want to say here? So we started out with Dr. McAllister, and this was his verse uh, that he started out with, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now for us pastors... There, there's actually two words for pastor. We have the word overseer there, sometimes translated bishop, and the word shepherd, and that's the word pastor. The word pastor means to shepherd. So he started out uh, with that, and he, he talked about the big marketing the church trend that was about 30 years ago, and he said that's really changed the landscape of evangelicalism where some churches actually would go door to door, not to share the gospel, but to say, what do you want in a church? Or what would it take to get you to come to church? So that, that is really, um, really caught on. And he talked about there's one church. I don't know where it was. I'm going to guess California. Their church theme was the flock that like to rock. And so Dr. McAllister said some of these churches are a mile wide and an inch deep. A couple of other statements. Discipleship has often pushed out evangelism. So I, I like that. That's just going to be something as we try to emphasize discipleship more. We don't ever want to emphasize discipleship at the cost of evangelism. Here's what should happen. Evangelism should fuel discipleship, and discipleship should fuel evangelism. They are the twin engines of the airplane. I'm not a pilot, but I understand with a twin engine airplane, the pilot has to constantly be slightly tweaking both engines to fly smoothly. So... So that'll be my job as the pastor as we emphasize evangelism and discipleship to try to do our best to uh, keep those balanced. Here's a statement that really caught my attention. Pastors don't come from seminaries. What? Sure they do. Great point. Pastors don't come from missionaries. They come through seminaries. Did I say missionaries? Uh, pastors actually come from Christian homes and churches. Uh, I think that's so powerful. Plan to raise up your next pastor from within. Wow, that may be kind of a novel thought, but you'll see another session where there's this 
shortage of pastors, I think churches are going to have to be coming uh, more and more mindful of uh, maybe we got to assume if we're our next pastor, we're going to have to take responsibility for that. Now, obviously, it worked out in this regard. I'm now the pastor, having been the assistant pastor, but most churches only have one pastor. So that is something we'll be talking about a little more. So that brings us to Dr. Fan. Does this statement he make sound a little familiar to Pastor Bryden? A healthy church is a church that glorifies God by equipped disciples continually making disciples. I heard him say that and I thought, yeah, okay, if Dr. Fant and I agree, that's, we, we got to be on to something here. So, uh, so I, I appreciated that. One, two, three, he's got six areas here, and, and I've made a note of these. The, these are six important areas that pastors, deacons, as well as input from the whole church that we want to make sure that we are that we're on track. Every church is going to be probably really well at doing a couple or three of those and maybe not so well at, at the other. So we want to shore up our weaknesses and keep, keep running ahead with the strengths that, uh, that we had. He raised this question, what do you know about your Jerusalem? Remember Acts 1.8, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So our Jerusalem would be what? It would be Parsippany and Morris County. So it's our responsibility to understand our community, our culture that we have here in order to help us reach it. Uh, what is the next step of faith to take? Uh, I've developed a great friendship with Dan Delavan. He pastors in North Jay, Maine. His, he is, was one of our sister churches a few weeks ago. He has been such a valuable uh, resource person to me. Um, so he had devotions every morning, so Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And based on Titus 2.15, these things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. So speak was Tuesday morning, exhort was Wednesday, and reprove was Thursday morning. This was just, just excellent. And he, he only spoke for like 12, well, 15 minutes. So I want to share a few of the things that, that he shared with us. The word speak. Um, now, now he's thinking in terms of pastors, but, but this would be true of all believers. Speak is not the word for preach. It's not the word for teach. So what does that mean? If we are supposed to be speaking uh, to one another, what is that all about? And it's present tense. It, it's, it's an ongoing speaking that happens. And it's, it's basically extended conversations. Reminds me of Deuteronomy 6. You know that passage where parents are instructed to teach your children not by sitting down and having official class time at the dining room table. It's just in everyday life, whatever's going on, just take, make that a teaching opportunity when you stand up, when you sit down. And, and that's what ought to be going on in our church. That, in a sense, is discipleship. Now, it may not, you know, it's not... You're meeting at a certain time and doing a curriculum. But anytime we, we just speak into one another's lives. That was the terminology he used, and I like that. We need to be speaking into each other's lives as a means of helping us and encouraging us. And he pointed out that it might be that a lot of conversations when we're at church don't even center around God. Okay, don't feel guilty if you talked about the NCAA tournament at lunch. That, you know, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, but in church especially, we ought to be making sure our conversations are encouraging. And that's uh, exhort. The second word is encourage. What are we to exhort to and encourage to? It would be Titus 2.12, which says, live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. That's what ought to be happening you know, before church and between services and after and when we're sitting at the table to be encouraging each other to live sensibly, righteously, and godly. It's a Greek word, parakaleo, which means to call alongside. So it's almost a picture of, you know, you're putting your arm around somebody. You know, sometimes that can be, you know, a really serious conversation. Sometimes it can be just like the basketball coach trying to encourage his player that, you know, just did something uh, really dumb or something like that. 
And then finally, reprove. And reprove is last for a reason. Your reproving will be much more effective and received if, if you've already been speaking, you know, just in a casual way into each other's lives, and then you've gone to the next step by encouraging, and then those times when you need to reprove, then uh, you can do that. So, Dan said this, if reproving others is your favorite task, then you've got a problem. Okay, I don't know that anybody, well, with rare exception, I don't know that any of us love reproving or rebuking or correcting someone else. So if it's your favorite subject thing to do, there's a problem. But if you never, ever would have opportunity, take opportunity to, to try to help somebody to point out uh, an inconsistency or a sin in their life, then that's a problem too. So it's not a fun thing to do, but uh, we all need to do it. Uh, the call of God. The word call means to designate, appoint, command. Sometimes this word is used with regard to salvation. So it doesn't mean an invitation. So this is primarily, uh, Pastor Lawrence, just a reminder to us pastors of how sacred it is that we have been called. It wasn't an invitation from the Lord, you know, um, hey, Jeff Bright, what do you think about being a pastor? You, you, want, you want to do that? I'd like to invite you to no, a call to the ministry is, it's a designation, it's an appointment, it's a command. Typically, at an ordination, we will be asked, so, could you, could you do anything else? And the council is listening, are they hearing, oh yeah, you know, I really like woodworking, I, I could do woodworking too, you know, as well as be a pastor, or, you know, no, I like, uh, you know, if, if you're called to ministry, you... You're appointed. You can't do anything else up until that point that you really believe God has called you to do something else. <clears throat> Here's an example of this happening. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for, which, or for the work to which I have called them. So there it is. It's interesting. Anyone in Scripture who's called to ministry is already busily serving the Lord. And that's exactly what happened to me. When I was a teenager, uh, I went to a large church, a large youth group, and, and I don't know, somehow, some way, I just got involved in doing everything in, in the church that I could. And it was out of the midst of that that God called. I don't think God calls people to ministry who are just kind of sitting around not serving him. God, God is going to call, as was true of Barnabas and Saul, those who are already involved. And God says, you know what? You've been a faithful servant of mine. I've got some greater responsibilities for you to, uh, you to do. Uh, that's why old preachers, they, they can't resist. If they have an opportunity to preach, they'll preach. You know, they'll have to hobble up to there and, and their voice will quiver and it'll be hard to turn the page. But, but when you've been called to ministry, you, you, you want to minister the word. Um, if you're not called and you go, I think that'd be a sin. There are people in ministry who really should not be in ministry. I don't know if they think it's an easy job or think they can make lots of money or if mama said you should, you should be a preacher, but if God hasn't called you, you shouldn't be. And the opposite is true. If you're called to ministry and don't go, that would be sin as well. And you know, I have to wonder, why is it that each decade that goes by, there are more and more churches that don't have pastors and they can't find pastors? And and Bible colleges and seminaries are closing. Where, where are the pastors going to come from? Why aren't there individuals who want to be pastors and missionaries? So that led to this session, The Coming Shortage of Pastors by Dr. McAllister. He said, men, what I want you to do, see that word coming, cross it out and write the word present. Because it's not like there's no shortage now and uh, there will be. So uh, that uh, was was a powerful uh, session. Just to demonstrate that, the average age of an evangelical pastor in 1992, 44, the average age of an evangelical pastor in 2017 is 54. So that was uh, still, what, three, seven years ago. I, I'm quite sure that the age continues to get uh, increased. Now here, Dr. McAllister, here's his own study 
um, not evangelical, which is much broader than, than a fundamental church, but strictly in fundamental circles, 75% of pastors are over the age of 50. And then in fundamental circles, 40% of pastors are over the age of 60. That would be me. So uh, those in ministry are aging. So therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. The word beseech is the word for crisis, emergency, urgent prayer. Maybe that's another reason why there is a shortage of pastors. Are we really praying for that? Periodically, this prayer request comes up in our Wednesday night prayer time. Lord, send out workers into the harvest. Pastors, missionaries, workers for our ministries here, as well as all of us sharing the gospel. I love this statement by Dr. McAllister. I want to be faithful, fervent, fruitful, and finish well to the glory of God. That's not true just for pastors. That ought, to be, that ought to be true for every one of you as far as whatever capacity the Lord has you serving him in to have that mindset. All right, moving right along. Healthy traits of, or common traits of healthy churches. Pray for God to do something, then prepare because you expect God to do something. So this, this stuck with me, you know, what, what do we want to begin praying for God to do here at Parsippany Baptist Church? And let's assume he's going to do it. So if he answers, we're going to be prepared for him to, uh, to do that. People give to a vision. They are tired of giving to a budget. That's interesting. Now, we're never going to get rid of the budget. We have to have a budget because we have so many ongoing things. But uh, what if, what if we had just an extra $200,000, what, what would we do with that? What, what would our vision be? Here's an opportunity for ministry. And it, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm going to be thinking more along those lines. Oh, there we go. Oh, there, there are only 50000 or 100000 Now, what's, what's fascinating and, and encouraging is there are more and more teenage kids boys who are coming to Shepherd's Haven. Some of them are homeschooled so they can do, some of them actually take time off school. So now they are designing a few tracks for the young guys while well, the other sessions are going on. So here were three that were held uh, during, during the conference, uh, living like a deacon even if you won't be one, preparing for marriage and a man's personal uh, walk with the Lord. Pastor Brown did this session. I think he did this here because I, I sort of recognize this. He's done some good work on the five passages on church discipline. He doesn't give the verses there, but you can find them. And the most masterful part is he got five D words here to, uh, to explain it. And, and you'll see it, it's not always the same thing. So that gives us a little bit of insight. Hopefully, the times we need to do church discipline will be far and few between, but depending on what the specific sin is, is going to determine generally the, you know, what, what we are going to do. So every discipline is not necessarily kick them out of the church. You know, there may be a variety of things. So that, that was a good, good summary. Knowing and reaching your Jerusalem Every town has its culture and subculture. How well do you know your Jerusalem? That's a good question. Be involved in the community. Yeah, I have a burden that our church be more involved, not just for the sake of being involved, but for giving opportunities for, um, at the very least, getting our church name out there and making contacts and sharing the gospel. There are seasons of ministry and then once they've come and are done, they're done. Some of you may remember 9-11. We had a brief window of opportunity. I think it caught us so off guard uh, that we, uh, we missed out on the opportunity. Remember how receptive people were right after 9-11? We had, what was it, a Thursday afternoon prayer time. And this, our church was packed with people from the community. And people were coming to church, but, but eventually that wore off. And so, so we need to be aware of 
do we have an opportunity? Are people receptive for, for this reason or that reason? And what can we do about it? Here's a convicting question. If your church closed, how long would it take your community to notice? Would, would, would they even notice if all of a sudden we're gone? Maybe because there's no more sign messages, but uh, I, don't, I don't know. So I know of churches that they'll, they'll do something in the community. It's not necessarily directly evangelism or passing out tracts, but, but their church name is on their T-shirts as they're in the community, like on a work day or something, trying to just make, make inroads. Why should the Lord direct someone to your church? Are you prepared to meet the spiritual needs of those the Lord is drawing? We need to be reaching the lost, and I think more and more as we do it, more people are going to be bringing more baggage. Okay, We've already had a male individual coming to church here wearing a dress. So, okay, we've already crossed that bridge. There's, there's going to be more things like that that are going to be happening if, if we're serious about reaching our community. What burden does someone have in your church? I will be open. If you have a burden for a group of people or for a ministry or whatever, I, I trust that, that I will hear you out and I'll pray about it. And I, I can't do everything that everybody thinks that we ought to do. But, but if someone in this church has as a burden, especially if it's just something they, they then of themselves, by themselves could take care of, I'm, I'm apt to say, go for it. We're, we're be, we'll pray for you. Do you need some resources? Uh, now, if it's an idea that involves the whole church, then that, that take a little more thought and planning. We're going to go ahead. God has put you where he needs you to be in order to bring people to Christ and Christ likeness. So let's never forget that. Finishing well and transitioning better. We have the great example of the Lord and Paul. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And he did it. Jesus is the only one who ever perfectly did exactly everything the Father wanted him to do. The Lord has a will for each one of us. He's got things planned out that he wants us to be accomplishing in our life, and we ought to be passionate about doing that. Paul said the same thing. He wanted to finish his course and ministry, which he received. He'll be able to come to the end of his life and say, I have finished the course. Oh, for every one of us to be able to say that. Come to the end of our life, we're in a hospice bed, and, and we can reflect and think, you know what? I wasn't perfect. I, I didn't do everything exactly that I know I should have done, but, but by and large, I did what I know God put me on this earth to do. And, and that's what you want to be thinking, and, and that'll, that'll encourage you. As you know, you're, you're very soon to meet the Lord. He's required in stewards that a man be found, uh, man be found faithful. Every pastor is an interim pastor. What? Every pastor is an interim pastor. Wait a minute. I was an interim pastor for 13 months. I'm no longer an interim pastor. Do you know what he means by this? No pastor is going to be here forever. And so, you know, I don't know how much to emphasize this to you folks, because I don't want to create panic, but I already have a burden for whoever's going to be the next pastor. I, at whatever point the Lord leads me on, or I, I could just drop dead, and then I wouldn't be able to think about it. But if the Lord allows me at some point to leave, to know that the church is, is left in, in good hands. So no pastor will be here forever. So that, that's something, and earlier you saw the quote of uh, churches more and more are probably going to have to start thinking, we need to, I almost use the word groom, I guess I can't use that anymore, um, uh, train our own, our own pastor from within our midst. Maybe he won't end up as the pastor of this church, but what a blessing that, that if we had the opportunity of training a young man for ministry, and then he could take over a church that is in need of a pastor, you should pray for future pastors for your congregation and from your congregation. That, I remember Pastor Brown saying that. That's a sign of a healthy church. If there are men and women who are being called to ministry. That's a, that's a neat thing, and I'd love to see that. What else we got here? The healthy-hearted pastor. Uh, these actually could apply to people who are not pastors. Close to the Lord, confident in the Lord, His word and promises, compassionate in pastoral care, cheerful in personal demeanor, courageous in times of conflict, careful in his personal testimony, 
committed to effective service. So I, you know, I appreciate these men, especially the two from the outside, so they, they can really hammer on us, you know, because they, they come to the conference and then they're gone. But uh, we, we, want, we want to be challenged. We wanted to be rebuked. And so this was, this was a good session. The Family Living for Christ. This is Howard Cole. So this is now, this would now be Wednesday. Normally at Shepherd's Haven, covering the book of Titus, each of us would take like two or three verses for like an hour session, just soak them for all we can. So since we had two outside speakers, they covered Monday night and Tuesday. So, so now the speakers who are left to cover Titus are having to cover a much larger block of verses and not, not able to be as detailed. But the sessions were still good. So Howard had doctrine and deportment. Deportment means uh, your, your, care, your conduct, yeah, your actions. What we believe affects what we do. So that's why it's so important to have the right doctrine. If your doctrine is off, your, your actions will be off. Uh, sometimes in those books of Paul, where the second half of the book is what we typically call practical, we might like to jump right to that. But there's a reason, like in the book of Ephesians, my morning series, why he has uh, Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. Really great doctrinal stuff. But then that's the foundation for the things that he's going to say about your work and uh, your family and uh, those other things in the last half of the book. As germs are to the physical body, so heresy is to the spiritual body. I think, as I recall, Howard was focusing on that word sound doctrine, hygienic doctrine, healthy doctrine. So when a church has healthy doctrine, sound doctrine, correct doctrine, uh, that will be an enhancement to the body. And then, then Pastor Brown picked up from there the look of gracious living, and then uh, Howard had a session on the apostleship of Titus. Did you think Titus was an apostle? Actually, there's, that word is used of him. So Howard took an entire session on that word apostle. So there are three categories of apostles. Apostles of Christ. And those would be the 12 disciples. Uh, obviously, Paul taking the place as number 12. And then there are other individuals who are also called apostles. It's usually not translated apostle in English. Sometimes it's translated as messenger. So some examples besides Titus would be Apollos, Barnabas, James, and Epaphroditus. Are all, at least in the Greek, are called apostle. Now apostle means one who is sent. And so, uh, so we, we can understand why these individuals would be called that. And all of them, even though I kind of look at the first category, capital A Apostle, and the second category, small a Apostle. And all of those did have a close connection with one of the Apostles. And then the Apostle of Apostles would be who? Jesus. I had forgotten this reference. Anyone know what book of the Bible it calls Jesus an Apostle? Hebrews 3.1. So, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Remember, apostle just means one who is sent on a mission. Well, yeah. Obviously, Jesus was sent on a very important and uh, special mission. Uh, Pastor Demers, he was here for the, he came down for the Brown Brothers Conference. I don't know if you uh, remember him. In fact, one breakfast... Uh, Jim, John, and I had, had breakfast with Pastor Demers, and that was, that was a blessing. So I'm, I'm glad for some of our men to get to know these pastors that we're praying for as our sister churches. And then Universalism's recent revival inside evangelicalism. This is Tim Lewis. He's in, um, I can't remember the town, North, Northampton, uh, New Hampshire, New England Shores Baptist Church. Uh, what does he have here? I don't know if you know what universalism is, the teaching that all humans will be reconciled to God in some way at some point in time and all will avoid eternal torment. An individual's destiny is not fixed at death, according to universalism, 
Those in the grave will have opportunity to be saved through Christ, thus denying the existence of an eternal torment in hell. The purpose of divine judgment is not retribution or penalty of sin, but purification and rehabilitation. Two types of universalists, the ultra Universalist. That means everybody immediately goes to heaven. Uh, that's not what uh, Pastor Lewis was address, addressing. I'm very familiar with these type because they always go to funerals. You know, every funeral you've ever been at, right? Especially of an unsaved person, they all everybody always goes to heaven. So that's uh, that's what he meant by that. But he's actually addressing, and I think this is his term, purgationist, and that's related to the word purging. So there is a time in torment, but it is a purging. So universalism, historically not widely accepted in orthodoxy. It's not a traditional Christian teaching. Early church fathers and reformers, by and large, rejected universalism. So just something to uh, keep on the radar. Oh, something else. If sinners didn't need a rescue, then why did Jesus come on a rescue mission? Uh, I think that's a legitimate question. And then another session where I heard things very similar to what I had been speaking on in January and February about discipleship. This is Pastor Ted Rich. And he's fairly new to Shepherd's Haven. When Mark Brown was between ministries, Mark Brown found great encouragement and refreshment in sitting under the ministry of Ted Rich until God opened up a ministry for Pastor Mark Brown. And so through that, Ted Rich now is an important part of Shepherd's Haven. He says this, counseling is either biblical counseling or worldly advice. You can't, I suppose you could have a little bit of, of mixture, but if, you, if you're mixing it, then a, a little bit of poison with good food is still poison, so that's what he means by that. You can teach, but if you're not teaching them to be like, act like, and speak like Jesus, then you are not discipling. Let's see if there's anything else I wanted to say here. And then again, normally Pastor Lawrence Brown would be just covering a few verses, really digging in deep. And what often is happening, we pastors know, like we know already next year's theme, and so we might be planning the preaching calendar. Oh, okay, next year's Shepherd's Haven is going to cover this. Maybe the year after that, I'm going to do that series in my church because I'll have had opportunity to learn some things. So, unlike most Pauline literature, Paul has doctrinal content and practical uses of such content embedded together throughout Titus. So it's mixed together, doctrine and the practical things, whereas some of Paul's books are first half and second half. These are the key ideas in that last chapter of Titus. Salvation, the appearing good deeds, and the duties of the pastor. I actually, at the end of this session, when it was, uh, he took some time for questions, I asked Pastor Lawrence, could good deeds, though we think primarily of good deeds within the church, could that include maybe the church being involved in good deeds in the community? And he said yes, and he quoted the verse, as much as lieth in you, do good to all men, but especially the household of faith. So, our priority for our good deeds and our ministries, primarily the local church, but, but just maybe there, there are some things we could be doing as a church to be opening some doors and, and making some contacts in our community so that we can uh, reach the community. Putting an end to boring benedictions. I think I already mentioned this in a church service that I thought what Pastor Justin was going to refer to was what you say at the end of the service, you know, to your people. But what he was actually referring to was the fact that Paul often ends his epistles with grace to you or grace be with you all. And, you know, we read that and we skip right over it. We go, okay, that's what you say, you know, like, you know, grace be with you all uh, because that's just what you're saying. It's not really meaningful. It's just time to end the letter. He gave this rather lengthy and not your typical definition of grace. Grace is God's benevolent intervention in our circumstances, thinking, and spiritual condition whereby he enables us by his power and provision 
to know, want, and do His will. So that was intriguing to me. I think I've got that uh, already written down and in my file on grace. I like this statement. It doesn't matter the size of the ministry, only the size of the God of the ministry. And that, that's great. That's one of the many unique things about Shepherd's Haven. I'll tell you this. Once, very often, if you have a pastor's conference or a church conference, and two pastors get talking to each other, invariably they'll say, well, how big's your congregation? But at Shepherd's Haven, nobody, nobody asks that. You know, it, I guess primarily because we all know most of us are in smaller churches, but, but that really is a conviction. It, it, it doesn't matter how size, or what the size of your church is. It's a church that God has raised up in that uh, location for his glory. I got a kick out of this. Pastoring is like parenting without the privilege of spanking. <laughs> Has Pastor Brian ever wished he could spank anybody? In the t- I'm not going to answer that question. Um, of course, we're talking about um, spiritual spanking. But um, anyway, I just got a kick out of that. Don't get caught up with the blessings of God, but with the God who blesses. That'd be a good thing to bring back when we have a Thanksgiving service. And then, we're just about done. You've been doing a good job staying awake. So, because they've expanded the leadership committee, I think they're really getting some good ground working ahead, and I think they don't have all the details planned out, but for the next two, three years, I think they know where they're going. So, so we already know next year the date, March 10 to 13, and it's going to be the Gospel of Mark. So, so some pastors very well, like I mentioned, might be thinking, okay, maybe 2026 or later in 2025, maybe a series on Mark after I've had this. So we have in our church budget a line called Shepherd's Haven. So $1,000 just, just went to Shepherd's Haven to the leadership team. Use it any way you want. There's also an additional $500 that I think this came up in a budget committee meeting that was given to me to invite a pastor to come to Shepherd's Haven who had never been there before. So, so I'll, I'll not mention his name, but there was a pastor in Pennsylvania who was at Shepherd's Haven for the very first time. It just ministered to him hugely. <coughs> oh, was that a President Trump term? Hugely, it, it really ministered to him. And it was made possible be, because of our church's ministry. So I think that was... That was, uh, that was great. I won't take questions. I'll dismiss you. And if you have questions, you can ask me. But you've done a great job. It's kind of warm in here. You've had a great meal. And uh, so I'll let you get home to your nap or to your basketball game or to your uh, choir rehearsal. But, uh, but I thank you. You use a church. You pay for me uh, to go here. So I appreciate uh, that. E- even if you didn't and weren't able, I would go. This is a great conference. I've said it often. I think I even enjoy more than, than even the sessions is, is the meals, not because of the food, but because of the interaction. Every table, you're sitting with a different group and, and the conversations. And, and I did a lot of brain picking, okay? I'm, I'm new at being a senior pastor. And so, so I actually had one main question that I asked maybe, I don't know, probably 10 pastors. And, and that was the subject of the breakfast that John, Jim, and I asked at Pastor Demers. And so, so I'm, I'm doing that. I'm trying to take advantage of men who are more experienced than me. And uh, that's, uh, th- that, was, uh, that was a help to me. As well as we have a lot of laughs. And it's encouraging to think, oh, you have that problem too. Oh, you, you have to deal with that. Oh, I, I thought maybe we were the only church that had to, to deal with that. So that was, that was good. So I, I thank you as a church for covering my way to go there. So I will pray, and then I'll, I'll let you go. Father in heaven, thank you for the ministry of Shepherd's Haven and allowing us as a church not only to send people there, uh, but, to, to, but to support it. We pray for your blessing on it. I pray that you would expand it, uh, not to bring glory to Shepherd's Haven, but so that more pastors are able to be encouraged and are able to be strengthened and are able to be better equipped to be your shepherds in uh, all sorts of locations. 
And what a reminder that you are building your church and you have raised up congregations and faithful pastors all over the uh, all over the Northeast. So these churches we pray for week by week. Bless their ministries, we pray. Uh, give us a great week, uh, a great week as you would define greatness, which would mean we are serving other people. Help us to be a good testimony, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.